very good morning and welcome to Media Monitor, the show that monitors and evaluates media coverage of leading stories of the week and puts the media in the spotlight. I am your host, Alicia Jadi. We are live right here on Channel 404. That's SABC News. A very good morning to you. In our lineup today, we start by discussing today's newspaper headlines, the coverage of the Net Nagasa reburial, the Oscar Pistorius murder trial. We have a follow-up on the Lesotho coup. And lastly, we analyze the media coverage of mob justice now to give us analysis of the coverage of these stories. Let's welcome Mr. Ralph Mateja, a political and media analyst, Mr. Melo Mahulejo, a columnist at thoughtleader.com, as well as Ms. Glenda Daniels, a lecturer at the University of the Vedvatas right now to give us more insight on the Oscar Pistorius trial. On the line, we will have a CBC reporter, Manoba Mkune, and all the way from Lesotho is the publisher of Lesotho Times, Basil Den Peter, to give us clarification on the Lesotho crew. Remember, you can call us to give us insight on the stories that you think deserve to be covered by the media but were omitted on the following numbers plus two seven if you're outside the country one one seven one four six eight four seven seven one four six eight four three and seven one four six eight five seven share views and comments on twitter at sa media monitor and like our facebook page of course media monitor very good morning to you All right, now as tradition, before we go into discussion with the stories that made headlines throughout the week, let's take a look at today's newspaper headlines panel. A very good morning to you. So glad to have you in studio. Let's start with you, Glenda. What's topping your news this morning? It's definitely, Alicia, the Oscar Pistorius case, and, and rightly so. I think the media have done a fantastic coverage from beginning to right to today, and it's going to continue. This is not the end of the matter. Mm. Ralph, what's making headlines for you? Yeah, well, it's Oscar, and also <laughs> today in my column as well, it's Oscar taking a completely different view. We'll talk about that mm. and the media frenzy about it. This is uh, one case that really got South Africans very much interested. But also interesting as well, you have the NPA coming into the media as well, uh, the Nkandla the report as well that has been filed, uh, and, and, and quite interesting, I think, uh, diversity of issues. Mm. Mm. Melo. Uh, for me, I think I'd also echo the sentiment of the Oscar story. I think for me, like the one thing that I really uh, enjoyed in terms of the coverage was bringing up the issue of whether or not the judiciary can be questioned, whether or not citizens can actively read or listen to whatever the judgment is and then afterwards be able to say whether they concur with that judgment or not. But that obviously does not detract from people being able to abide by the judgment, but I think that's very good and very healthy because I think the thing that it does is that it sort of engenders a spirit where people understand that there's a distinction between justice and distinction between the law. And that for me I enjoyed in terms of the media coverage. How long do you think the media um, coverage is going to last on the Oscar Pistorius trial, Glenda? Well, you know, the Twitter explosion has been quite amazing. So let's not just talk about the traditional, the um, the traditional mediums. Twitter's going crazy. And they actually, you know, people in the country actually want an appeal on this. It's very hard for the state to appeal. Normally, it's easier for the accused for the defense, side to, yes. for, you know, to, to appeal. But in this case, it's going to be fascinating to watch if we get this appeal. Because there's outrage, actually, not just in the country but all over the world about this verdict. It's, it's an anti-violence against women verdict, in my view. Mm. Um, this just flies in the face of you know, everything we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to create a, a more just society. We're trying to create a more peaceful society. We're trying to get men to understand why they should not kill, rape women, and yet this has happened, and he gets off with culpable homicide. This is not an accident. Mm. How did you feel about the reaction on Twitter, Ralph? Well, there is quite an outrage on Twitter, and I think it is a policy issue in South Africa where we know that where we are, there is a concern about how our society respects women and mm -hmm. uh, also women and children. And, and we have seen in the past violence against women, but it is, it is being brought into this trial. But there is one thing that needs to be very clear about this, and I want to take a very different view from uh, what I've heard. Uh, People are saying that there need to be a serious conviction. It's not up to the judge to enforce policy in court. The judge weighs in the evidence as, as presented by the prosecution and therefore decide each case. But look at the case, Sunday Times headline is. there, uh, Ralph, Oscar judge under fire. There is pressure. There is no doubt about that. South Africans are outraged. But here is the question. Did the prosecution present their case well? Did they really present a case that you could say is watertight? We shouldn't forget that the maxim in South African law is that uh, the prosecution 
the state has to prove its case beyond, beyond reasonable, reasonable doubt. doubt. When there is doubt, and there is doubt in this case, this is a purely circumstantial a case based on circumstantial evidence. When there is doubt, it is not up to the judge to make assumption to the detriment of the accused. It's never the case. We should also take into consideration as well that as much as we are outraged about this, as the state, we have resources to present that watertight case. The accused has got a few shots at this, have to pay for the legal fees from their pocket. Hence, the justice system is such that it protects an individual against the outrage of the state. We are going to have to live with that. I'm of the view that as time goes by, the outrage around this judgment is going to subside. And the NPA is under pressure. They are going to weigh in whether is there such a serious error in law to an extent where they can appeal this case. And I think as the pressure eases, they're going to consider that. If they get a better sentence from culpable homicide, culpable homicide is serious, no doubt. But if they get a better sentence, a stiffer sentence out of this, mm -hmm. I'm of the view that they might not appeal this. But Ralph, the, and, and the pressure as well will ease. Ralph, you know what? We've got a whole segment dedicated to Oscar. So that story is coming up. I'm actually pretty surprised at the fact that our top story today, and of course, is the reburial of Net Nakasa, and it didn't even make uh, any headlines today. Well, people arrived at the <laughs> Durban City Hall for from all over the country yesterday morning to honor late journalist Net Nakasa. Let's take a look at this insert. A very inquisitive journalist. He wanted to find out things and he asked the difficult questions. Um, if you look through his writings, you will find that he is still searching for these answers to these difficult questions at a time when it was dangerous to ask those questions. All right, now, panel, with Nat Nakasa being brought home, has the media given the people all about who he is, what happened to him, why was he a journalist, what, who was he writing for? Let's start with you, Melo. I think for me, this story is very interesting in how, I suppose, perhaps unremarkable it tends to be. Because we have so much accustomed in our country that the lives of the people that we profile uh, sort of dovetail with the milestones of the country, whether it be the Vonia trial, the Defiance campaign, or June 16 and so on. And if you look at Net Nagasa's life, his life does not necessarily fit into that typical mold. So then it brings up the question of what did Net Nagasa do? Why is it that we are celebrating Net Nagasa? Why is it that we are reburying him and bringing him from overseas? And I think for me, one of the things that I would have really appreciated from the media is if there were to be sort of like a portfolio of his work that we could also be able to interact with and read and be able to see, okay, this is why we're celebrating this guy. I mean, for example, if we had maybe a Peter Makuban or an Alf Kumal that was being celebrated, that I would expect that there'd be photos of whatever it is that they've produced in their work, and then we'd be able to evaluate that. So for me, I found that very much missing. So I think the other thing also that I'd also uh, like to highlight is in his story, some people have come out and said that they do not feel that Net Nagasa's life is necessarily that remarkable compared to some of his contemporaries. And I think for me, from that way, we can rationalize the, just, uh, we can rationalize the media coverage of this from the angle of that government has used this as an opportunity to sort of send an olive branch across to the media establishment and saying that we see you and we recognize your role and then you guys are important in fulfilling an important role. We care and about you. Exactly. And mm. I think if you take the words perhaps of Sir Ramaphosa, he said that the media should annoy us, should challenge us and should uh, encourage us to be more inclusive in how we govern. Yeah. Annoy us, Glenda. I think, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, annoy us. But I, I think Nat Nakasa's also very famous for writing beautifully. He, he, he had a, a beautiful way with the language. And I think that's where you, you write and saying maybe the media should have put more of his writings on the paper. But I think in terms of what they've covered, uh, what his significance was. I mean, the issue of an exit permit, a lot of people don't know that in South Africa. Why did he take an exit permit? What is an exit permit? So it, it also shows the evil of apartheid and what happened. Um, way back in, in, the, in the 1960s, that he couldn't come back. He had a Tanzanian passport, for instance, mm. and he wasn't allowed to come in here. He had residence for a, short, a study permit for, for the US. And the loneliness of what he was doing killed him. Whether, you know, there's, there's controversy and there's dispute about whether he committed suicide, but whether he jumped off a building or whether he was pushed, his life when he went to seek freedom in the free world it didn't happen. He, he, you know, he was a broken man. Mm -hmm. So for all that, and, and it took nearly 50 years for him to be reburied. That's part of why people like Matata Seadu, Joe Brajo from the, the press council, 
um, uh, Magubani, etc., are, are so you know a cry about this issue because it shouldn't have taken so long. All mm. the the bureaucracy and the bungling for him to be buried in his own country. Mm. He wasn't mm. able to write properly in his own country. He wasn't able to express himself, and he wasn't truly the 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 one of the same kind of comrades as you'll see from the stories that are written. He defied apartheid. He wanted to sleep with white women, and he did. He didn't want to drink as much as his other comrades. You know, he, he was very much somebody who was different. He was a free spirit, and he was, that's why he's such an icon. Today he's now become an icon for all journalists, which I think is just fantastic. This is the good news story in today's paper. Mm. Ralph, why isn't the media giving us young people an update of what, who really Nat Nakasa is and why he's so significant to journalism in South Africa? It's very interesting that uh, if you go to the U.S. Uh, and, and you look at, uh, you go to the, the library, NYU, New York University, you find more writing and rendition about his work than you find here, which is quite odd. And, and it shows that uh, uh, within the literary society, of course, he might be known within the literary society, he's being celebrated within the literary society, but in the popular media, he's not so much well known. I read about him first time when I was in high school, and as I've, I've tried to recapture what he is about now, it, 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 it brings in the home the brutality the personal brutality of apartheid as you correctly stated he was homesick couldn't get back home and at the age of 28 or so very young for a person and anyone who who, who has been out of your country at that age you realize that actually it can even get even lonely but i think sanef has tried to do a good job on this it is just that the media seems not to have much appetite for this historical outline of where we come from we, we're just moving from one scandal to another really not given this, I think, the depth of coverage that it actually requires. Ralph, why hasn't media then, uh, you know, highlighted some of the challenges that past journalists like Net Nakasa faced and it, compared to those ones now? I think it, offered, it offers, a, actually history offers a good frame in order to highlight some of the challenges that journalists face now. There is this notion that he was uh, unaffiliated. He was not, uh, he was almost he concentrated on the truth as he, he sees it. Didn't want to attach himself with political parties or any kind any of movement for mm. that. And journalists, maybe they need to find a way to actually uh, frame the challenges they are having today from that kind of a story. Because you do have the same challenges today with the journalists who are being, some are being asked whether are you affiliated with this house, are you, it's, it's, the challenges remains the same. He was dealing with the state by then, of course, a repressive state, but also the liberation movement. Even now, how the journalists should also position themselves currently young journalists for that matter who are trying to make a living in a very hostile environment uh, when it comes to earning a livelihood mm. and even being seen by the powers that be. So he offers a great opportunity for people to just frame some of the challenges that have been All right, them. all right. That's where we leave it with Nat Nakasame's soul rest in peace. And when we return, we continue to discuss the coverage of the Oscar Pistorius murder trial. Join the conversation by calling us on plus two seven one one seven one four six eight four three seven one four six eight four seven and 7146857 and let us know which stories anywhere you are you feel we're not adequately covered by the media. You can also share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor and like our Facebook page Media Monitor. Don't go anywhere. We'll return shortly after this. Zoom into Africa. This is Mali. The president is Mr. Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Mali got independent from France on 20 June in 1960. The population is more than 16 million people. One of Mali's major languages spoken is Arabic. Monetary unit is CFA.
come back. You can also be part of our discussion by calling and tweeting us. You can ask your questions too via our Twitter account at SA Media Monitor and throw them to my panel of experts. We also want to hear your views on our topics. In our next story, the Oscar Pistorius trial dominated the media both locally and internationally throughout the ruling given by Judge Togo Zidemasipa to Oscar is of culpable homicide and not murder. Let's take a quick look at this insert compiled by one of our producers, Malibo Homakutle. A trial that has stirred mixed reactions amongst the public and media in South Africa and abroad is nearing an end. Having regard to the totality of this evidence in this matter, the unanimous decision of this court is the following. One, on count one, murder read with section 51.1 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act, 105 of 1997, the accused is found not guilty and is discharged. Instead, he is found guilty of culpable homicide. I think the judge was wrong because at the end of the day, it is murder. He was supposed to, you know, be accused or something, yeah, nah, about it. Well. At the end of the day, she has to do her job, and we don't know what goes through her process and stuff like that. But she did explain it in detail on how she came to her decision and stuff like that. So I think that she's only doing her job, and she has to be fair on both sides. It is a trial at the end of the day. We hear both sides, and then she comes to a verdict. So it's not murder, but then there's still something that he's going to be punished for. It can be comable homicide. homicide. So yeah, Oscar will get what he deserves at the end of the day, and Reva's family will get justice. I actually followed the case online this morning and uh, I was expecting him to be found guilty because the tweets keep ca ca kept coming through, uh, the, re the responses were quite negative. ...for Pistorius is set for October the 13th. We'll postpone it to the 13th and see what happens. Miss will be, we will be available and ready. Thank you very much. All right, let's welcome on the line ACBC reporter Chris Selda Lewis, who's been at the forefront of this trial, covering it for our ACBC viewers. Chris Selda, very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us now. It feels like just yesterday when we had you in studio to give us your anticipated views about the start of the trial. Now the trial is just about over. Your views on the coverage throughout? Well, a very good morning to you, Alicia. Well, as expected, you know, uh, we were expecting this to be one of the biggest stories since the death of uh, the former president, Nelson Mandela. And certainly it, it, it really proved to be so when we saw the throngs of media that were there, you know, every morning just jostling for the best shot of Oscar Pistorius. And I must say, uh, you know, yesterday certainly was, you know, one of those days where, the media were really scrumming outside. I've got the bruises to even show for it, where really, you know, camera person, journalists, all outside trying to get shots of Oscar Pistorius. So really, I think um, as we near the end, but not, uh, of course, the other processes that are expected to happen within this case. But, uh, you know, we return to court, of course, in October, and we, we're not expecting the media uh, interest to dwindle uh, at all, in that we're looking at at this case, you know, with, with very close uh, uh, um, interest because it's dominated the headlines both here in South Africa and internationally as well. We've really seen how the international media differ in terms of their coverage uh, with South Africans uh, mm. to fair. Now, Criselda, social media was a huge part of this trial. And, of course, we know that the judge wasn't influenced by any of the posts, but what evidence was presented to her? Let's now look at how the media itself reacted when the verdict was announced. Did the media support Judge Masipa's ruling? Alicia, I don't think it was an issue of support. Of course, we're there to report on the facts. But uh, certainly, you know, I can only speak about gauging from what ordinary uh, South Africans had told me was that, you know, you had uh, one part where South Africans were saying it was unfair, um, that uh, Oscar Pistorius should have, you know, uh, been uh, found guilty of murder. And, you know, some saying that, well, you know, the only person we can rely on here is Judge Togazina Masipa. She's made her decision. She's looked at the, she's looked at the evidence, weighed it, and how that ties in with the law. And given, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 
a, a judgment that she believed uh, that uh, was fitting for Oscar Pistorius in this case. You'd recall she'd mentioned several times as she was giving that verdict how, not in her uh, particular words, but she pointed to how weak the state's case was and how the state did not prove beyond reasonable doubt several aspects of this case. So, you know, um, really... Uh, you got a, a lot of a sense from South Africans about a disappointment and others who felt that she was simply doing her job. Mm, thank you so much, Chris Elder, for that. That was SABC reporter Chris Elder Lewis with us on the line to give us a wrap of the journalistic side of the Oscar Pistorius murder trial. Now, panel, I think we warned the people to let the law take its course in terms of this case. Now, why are we seeing such large reports of dissatisfied Oscar Pistorius trial followers. Glenda, let's start with you. Look, life has changed. Life has changed for the media. Life has changed for the judicial system because now we are participants. And the media has done a fantastic job by actually picking at the minutiae of this case. Mm. Uh, we don't just, like in, in those days, we used to sit back. That's what the judge says. That's what the system says. And we accept it. And I think it's a very good thing for democracy that the media can do what it's doing. So let's just look at that case. In terms of points of law, the things that society has not been given, um, which version did the judge accept? We don't know. There are a few versions, and even just on that, we can say Oscar was a liar. From our lay people's point of view and from the media point of view, this man is a liar because he's given various versions of why he picked up that gun and ran to the toilet door mm. to shoot. Number two. Oh, that's the one thing. Number two, a lot of questions have been unanswered. In fact, and it's up to the media to point this out to the public that a lot of questions have been unanswered. Why did you not look? All of us look when there's a noise. We look at our partner. Is the partner okay? Or is it the partner that's making the noise? Before you pick, we don't have guns. But for those who do have guns, before they pick up the gun to run to shoot. Number three, why, why, why did the judge not question this issue about why would somebody who's with her lover in bed lock a toilet door while mm. she's going to, to use the toilet mm. and with a cell phone? Those things the media picked up on, but it didn't appear in court. So I'm saying the media did a very good job by picking at these little details. Why, and everyone on social media and, and the public at large are asking the question, if it was an accident, Surely you'd fire once and then boom, there's an accident. Glenda, Why do you fire please hold four that times? Thought. Please okay. hold that thought, Glenda. Let me take a Mohale from Peter Maritzburg. Mohale, a very good morning to you. Thank you for staying on the line. Your comment, please, sir. Yes, uh, quickly. I understand the public outrage about uh, the massive findings in the Oscar trial. But people should understand that the judge comes to a certain determination based on what is uh, presented, the evidence that is presented in court. So in this case, instead of uh, uh, gunning against uh, Judge Masipa, we should be directing our energies and anger at Harinel. That is the person who was arguing for conviction in that court. Mm. Thank you so much, Mahale from Peter Maritzburg. Ralph? Well, you know, there is a public outrage. There is no doubt about that. And the questions that Landa is asking are very critical. Mm. But if the, if the prosecution... Uh, with many years of prosecution, having gone to law school, senior advocates such as uh, Harinel, if he realizes he cannot present that in court, it's because he's aware that it is not going to hold. There is a, 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 what, the debates are, should be welcome, though. The debates about the manner in which South Africans engaged with this judgment should be quite welcome. Uh, law cannot just be distanced from the reality of life, cannot be distanced from the society. It has to be applied in a way that it reflects that. But again, you cannot uh, uh, arbitrarily try to impose policy in, 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 in law by just trying to arbitrarily secure a prosecution in a case where you don't have a strong case. If, you, if we go back to that case, there was an indication earlier in the, in the media that uh, uh, the prosecution was going to even paint the picture of uh, a turbulent relationship between Oscar and, 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 and the deceased. Mm. They never did that. It's because they knew they couldn't hold on to that. Mm. And they select evidence on the basis of what can hold in court. And I think I wouldn't want to be in the position of the NPA at this point, that they are so much under pressure. I mean, when the media goes on and say that uh, uh, Oscar's judge under fire, it's how it, it's how it's being presented. Already, the NPA is under pressure to appeal this, and they know this case is based on circumst circumstantial. And evidence. I want to get back you to that point, Ralph, yeah. very quickly. Let me take JJ from Polokwane. JJ, very good morning to you. Your comment, please. Uh, good, good, good morning. 
Please go and ahead, JJ. You, you see, when the state looked at this case, it, leave, it left the loophole, I don't know, deliberately or not deliberately. Because the most crucial evidence in this, they should have asked why Oscar Pistorius tempered with the evidence. Because he is the one who released the four shots. And after finding that the lady there is killed, he carried the body outside the toilet. And you, you see, it's very strange for somebody who is threatened instead of calling the ambulance, instead of calling the assistance, then you carry the body. He realized in the process that there is, he needs to temper with the evidence, and the state failed to look into that. Mm. Thank you so much, JJ from Polokwane Miller. I think for me, the first thing that I'd like to highlight is the underlying trend that's happening in the country in terms of the transformation of the media vis-a-vis -vis the social media. Because what is happening is that you're starting to have that social media sort of disintermediating the process between consumption of news and the media houses. So, for example, I'm not going to go now and read maybe in the Star or in the Sunday Times, whatever it is that was reported to be happening there. But I'd go and say, if Alicia Jali is a uh, editor, I mean, a uh, reporter at the Sunday Times, I'd follow her Twitter feed and I'd read whatever it is that she's posting there without necessarily having to go afterwards and go and read in the specific media house publication. So I think that is that is really highlighting a broader trend that is happening in the country and I think also this trend will also start coming in when we start having more live streaming of events because we also in this Oscar Pistorius trial we had live streaming of the events so it wasn't really that much necessary for media to summarize what has happened because people were already following so what became more important than was issues of analysis and interpreting whatever mm. it is that was being said in the courts and so on. All right thank you Melo. Let me take Kamkwale from Namibia. A very good morning to you and thank you for joining us. Your comment please. Kamgwale, are you still on the line with us? All right, I think we seem to have lost him, but please do try and call us again. Now, to get back to your earlier point, Ralph, um, one of the callers was saying that uh, the judge only works with evidence uh, provided or presented to her. Why then hasn't media highlighted this to the people itself to say that, look, well, the judge only can work with the evidence because people are now criticizing Judge Masipa as if it's her own ruling? I mean, you need education on that. Uh, not everybody else went to law school. That's a fact. And those who are uh, the lawyers who are presenting this case in court, actually, they are not too far from each other about what actually happened in the judgment because they understand that there is the a particular process. way in which evidence has to be presented. But o o on the side of this, you have the policy issue. And I think we need to attend to the policy issue, the policy of making sure that women are safe in our society. We cannot translate that policy position into what we require from the judge as the, like the judge has to prosecute without sufficient evidence and if we are really serious on this policy we need to actually turn the heat on the prosecution on the basis of the evidence they've put up and also to say to the prosecution that uh, where have you bungled this case uh, there is someone who mentioned in the tempering of the evidence when yes. it is there were indications of the tempering or, or the crime scene where it was not well handled the the, the police investigators have been have been changed since the case was initially open since that we need to go back to those debate and try to outline where has it happened where where what actually caused the th what made the case the state case so thin we can't just put everything else on the judge i don't want to live in a society where if there is a doubt about my guilt the oh. judge just assumes i'm guilty all right ralph let me take macbeth from white river macbeth a very good morning to you thank you for joining us your comment please uh, morning, Alicia, as well as your guest. Morning, uh, Go ahead. Very few people have analyzed the, the chat sheet per se, how it read. We have to look at the chat sheet. How, what did Colonel put on the chat sheet? And then that's what judge works on. Would work on what is contained in the chat sheet. And Oscar Pistorius would plead on what is contained in the chat sheet. Now, the chat sheet read that there was a shooting, and this shooting, in terms of the indictment, uh, he killed intentionally and unlawfully Rivers Denkam. And then it further goes on to say that there was a quarrel to which the deceased ran into the bathroom. If you listen to all Colonel's evidence, there's no one, no one suggesting exactly what is contained on the chat sheet. Therefore, you cannot expect the judge 
to manufacture evidence based on the court of public opinion or some Twitter account or Facebook. He would work on what he's having. Thank you so, so in this much, regard, Judge Masipa was within her right to say the burden of proof does not shift. It's always with the state. So whether Oscar Pistorius enters the witness box and he becomes a laughable witness or a miserable witness or an unreliable right, witness, Beth. doesn't matter. Okay, thank it you, Macbeth. Thank you so much uh, for your point. Unfortunately, we have to take a very quick ad break. And when we return, we're going to look at the media coverage of the Lesotho coup. You can still be part of our discussion by expressing your views as to which stories you think should have been covered by the media by calling us on plus 2711 and 714 Share views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor and as well as on Facebook. Stay with us. This is Media Monitor. Kenyan actress is the first from her country to win an Academy Award. Her Best Actress Oscar win has inspired many in Kenya. Nyongo's victory has made the headlines in all of the country's newspapers. This was Nyongo's first role in a film after she had completed postgraduate studies in America. Players in South Africa's music industry will attend the music exchange program in Cape Town, South Africa. We as Africans, we have to embrace what is unique about us and about our music. That's Afro Showbiz News, Saturdays, 7.30pm on SABC News. Welcome back to Media Monitor. You can still be part of our discussion by calling us on the numbers that will appear at the bottom of your screens or contact us on Facebook as well as on Twitter. In our next story, a very big story, the Lesotho political crisis continues as coalition parties have reached a deadlock on the opening of parliament. South African Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa will continue to mediate talks between the political parties. Let's now get a better understanding of what is happening in Lesotho. Let's welcome on the line Mr. Basilden Peter, publisher of the Lesotho Times. Basildan, a very good morning to you and thank you for joining us on Media Monitor. Thank you. Now, Basildan, we would like to know what seems to be the main barrier between media and actual facts about the real situation in Lesotho. Please talk to us. Well, uh, the problem with Lesotho, as you know, is the media is not as vibrant as, uh, for instance, here in South Africa. Uh, there is no daily newspaper in Lesotho. I think Lesotho is the only country in the world without a daily paper. And uh, yes, there is a television station, but it only publishes uh, a few hours a day. Uh, so that in itself is an impediment to the free flow of information. Uh, mm -hmm. People simply don't know. They cannot monitor events on a, on a regular basis. Uh, the only channels which they can use uh, are the radio stations, which have challenges on their, of their own in terms of uh, keeping the nation informed. So there is that paucity of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of media uh, in Lesotho, mm. which hampers, I think, the free flow of information. Now, Basildan, last week we had viewers from Lesotho appealing for media to come to get the full story on the ground, criticizing international media for giving wrong facts. But is this possible? Is the political crisis not getting in the way of media delivering the true facts about the crisis in the country? And really, in your knowledge, was there a coup or not? Well, you see, the Lesotho is not a, a, a regular item uh, on the news menu uh, in the international media. So um, I think there is a, a concern that the way the story is being covered is uh, is not uh, is not an accurate reflection on uh, of what is happening on the ground. I think I tend to disagree. Uh, I think by and large the international media has been able to get the facts right. It's only that the situation in the country itself is very confusing. For instance. There isn't any unanimity as to whether what happened 
did amount to a coup or not. The government, the prime minister said, yes, it's, it was a coup. The other side, uh, the prime minister's opponents and others say it wasn't a coup. So it then makes it extremely difficult for an outsider, be it a journalist or whoever, to get an appreciation of the facts. It would help, of course, if the media were on the ground, the international media were on the ground, and not try to report the story from afar. But by and large, uh, those that have been on the ground have been able to capture the story. Uh, it is as confusing as it is, if I may say. Basildon, thank you very much for your time. That's Basildon Peter, publisher of the Lesotho Times. On the line with us from Lesotho, you heard it right here. Comment on social media, give us a call. Now, panel, very interesting that the publisher of a of, of, of paper there says that um, it's, it's, they have non-vibrant yes. media in the country, so much so that we're inundated with calls last week. People in Lesotho saying they have no idea what's going on. We need to come in there and find out what's going on. Glenda. Look. What's going on right now, and I had to struggle to get this information, is that there's a stalemate with the SADC process. So there's no mediation that's actually happening that's going forward. But the fact that I had to struggle in South Africa to get the news, and Lesotho people don't have the news, I don't, I don't actually know what's going on in Lesotho. You know, who's on what side, who's on the side of democracy, whether this, the, the president's a good guy or a bad guy, even the basics, you know, some of us don't know and we, we follow the news. So I think this is quite a tragic situation. I don't know if it's any indictment on the South African media that we need more reporters out there in Lesotho actually to go in there and find out exactly what's happening with the military, who's occupied what, who's actually running the country at the moment. I actually don't know. So that's a sad reflection. Mm. Ralph, is it fair of him to, to blame resources, the lack thereof in terms of coverage, uh, proper coverage and, and delivering the facts? Clearly, we do have a dilemma here because Lesotho is a sovereign country. I don't think it is the obligation of South Africa's media to even tell the people of Lesotho what's going on in Lesotho. All right, That's Ralph, before you go on, let me quickly take Joe from Midrand. Joe, very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Your comment, please. Hi, Alicia. Thank you for, uh, for taking my call. Please go ahead, Joe. Yes, Alicia, I just want to go back to that issue of uh, Oscar Pistorius. I just want to raise two issues here. Go ahead. Uh, the first one, uh, Alicia, is uh, the rule of the fire up is firearm is meant to kill. And then secondly, uh, the, the second rule says, never point a fire up to a person unless you intend to kill him. All right. Okay, thank that's you so much uh, there. That's Joe on the line. Do you want to quickly, quickly say something very quickly, Melo? No, I do agree with him. I think for me, one of the things that was missing in the judgment per se and was highlighted in the reporting was the judge's interpretation of what intention means. Because there was a question of objective intention versus subjective intention. The objective intention was in the culpable homicide, which is the test for it, which says, should Oscar Pistorius have foreseen that he might kill somebody? Mm -hmm. That's the test for culpable homicide. Now, the subjective intention, which is the test for murder, where did he in fact actually foresee that he would kill somebody. And for me, I think what the caller is saying here speaks to that notion of subjective intention in that when Oscar picked up the gun instead of picking up a cricket bat to go and confront the intruder, isn't that some form of intention of effecting a form of killing? When Oscar stood there and shot the person, isn't that some form of intention? There? So for me, I found it very interesting that the judge chose a period after the event to characterize Oscar's intention. And the period after the event was whether Oscar was crying afterwards, whether he was praying to God, whether he was howling and calling people and the judge said that exonerates Oscar from having had intention beforehand. Thank you, Melo. So I agree with him. Thank you very much, Melo. All right, let's continue with Lesotho. Ralph, you were touching on a very important point there. Yeah, certainly. I was saying that uh, South Africa is not obligated to inform the people of Lesotho about what goes on in their own country in Lesotho. That will be triumphing on other countries' sovereignty. So I think the challenge, though, in Lesotho is that uh, even from an uh, external point of view, from us being a sovereign country and Lesotho being a sovereign country, we still don't have uh, at least good reports or, or, or substantive reports about Lesotho. I mean, this coup, that, that, that uh, whatever you call it, uh, 
the misunderstanding that resulted in the Prime Minister leaving his own country because some are saying it's not a coup. It, 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 it has been preceded by certain incidents that have not been reported upon, including even uh, it's, it's being recaptured now, the firing of a rocket at the Prime Minister's house. Those are the information that one would expect that uh, at least we would have had to get from uh, uh, our own media about what's going on in the country, but not to the depth of what the Basuti people might expect from their same media. And, uh, and I'm saying this from the point of view of, of sympathy as well. It's not obligation of South Africans okay. to tell Basuti people how they should be reported about. All right, okay. uh, let's take Kamgwale back with us on the line all the way from Namibia. Very good morning to you. Thank you for getting back to us. Your comment, please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Alicia. How are you? We're very well. Thank you, Kamgali. Go ahead with your point, sir. Good. Um, thank you for the media to make it possible for us, even beyond the border of South Africa, to be able to be seen uh, what is going on in South Africa. Thank and you. Um, I have uh, that point of um, uh, Pistorius, Oscar Pistorius, when he uh, shot a girlfriend in the toilet. My question, my, my, we must not blame the judge there. We, we must only uh, look at the state prosecutor who, who was on the side of the, the, the uh, against the, uh, the defense. Because maybe he could not provide a, a very good reason why uh, uh, Pistorio should be found uh, guilty on murder. But, but uh, the, the, the other thing about Pistorius, uh, I'm also saying Pistorius did it in, uh, in, with, with the papers. Because when he go, before he go and uh, shut the, 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 the door of the toilet, he should have known where is river that time. And where he was liver that time, and where is Pistorius that time, just before they heard the sound in the, in the, in the, in the, in the toilet. Thank you so much, Kamwale, all the way from Namibia. It's very interesting that this case has actually just caused a yeah. stir all over the African continent. What are your views on the last caller's uh, views, uh, Glenda? Well, I mean, I think that the, the point is that um, I think that the, prosecu uh, the, the, the state's case mm -hmm. was actually a very good one. Kerry now was absolutely fantastic and all the evidence was presented. I think that's why people have are so puzzled about the, the verdict. That's why you're hearing what you're hearing. Everyone is terribly puzzled because, in fact, it was such a strong case on the totality of evidence. Mm. Um, on, on the Lesuit thing and why journalists shouldn't be, in, uh, South African sh journalists shouldn't be too involved, well, it is a landlocked country by South Africa. Don't forget, it's right in the middle of South Africa. It, it's a sovereign state, and we should care. And if there aren't resources there for journalists, shouldn't we, as brothers and sisters of a neighbor, neighboring country, you know, care? Mm. But um, I just want to go back to the, the Oscar thing, because everyone's interested in the Oscar thing. Um, <laughs> I, I'm crossing my fingers, together with a whole lot of South African women who live with vulnerability every single day of their lives from domestic partners in, in their own marriages and in their own relationships, walking to their cars, in, um, where, wherever they go, whether they go to a bar to have a drink, they're vulnerable. If they go to a club, they're vulnerable. Every day, South African women, black and white, and of all classes, live with this kind of vulnerability about vi uh, violent men in this country. Something has to be done, and we have got to somehow rely on something, on even if it's the justice system, to do the right thing. Let's ask the media. We're on the media show. So media, there it is. Well, stay tuned because when we return, we'll be discussing the coverage of the mob justice that happened in Mamelodi in Pretoria. You can still call us on plus two seven one one seven one four six eight four seven seven one four six eight four three and seven one four six eight five seven. Share views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor as well as on Facebook. Don't go anywhere. Zoom into Africa. This is Ghana. The president is Mr. John Dramani Mahama. Ghana got independent from the United Kingdom on 6 March in 1957. 
The population is more than 25 million people. One of Ghana's major languages spoken is English. Monetary unit is CD. Welcome back. You can also be part of our discussion by contacting us on the numbers that appear at the bottom of your screens. Not forgetting Facebook as well as Twitter. Angered residents of Mamelodi East took matters into their own hands earlier this week and severely beat a man they believe to be a serial killer. Let's take a look at this insert. All right, we do apologize for the lack of sound on that insert. But panel, let's talk about this. What picture are we seeing media painting about mob justice currently? Let's start with you, Meadow. I think for me, the interesting issue here is people's understanding of the legal process and people's in emotional and intimate sense of justice. And I think there's a bit of a disjuncture between those two things. I do not feel that necessarily people have that much faith in the law to be able to effect what they term to be justice. For example, some of the complaints that one regularly hears is that people go and charge rapists and then the very next day you see the rapist walking in the street. People go and charge murderers and the very next day you go and see that guy walking in the street. So I think there is a little bit of a disjuncture between what happens within the legal system and what people perceive as justice. And I suppose it speaks also to this Oscar issue that perhaps this questioning and this grappling with Judge Masipa's uh, judgment, what it offers us is an ability to be able, to, an opportunity to be able to reconcile ourselves to the limits of the law and the need for us to be able to respect the law in that sense. All right, thank you so much, Melo. Uh, let's take a look now at that clip once again. There's nothing in all three of these, um, these murders. There's nothing that suggests that uh, there is a serial killer on the loose. No modus operandi that's the same. So we cannot at this stage say that there is a serial killer on the loose in the area. Uh, we unfortunately got the kangaroo courts. We've got these systems where people take law into their own hands. Um, we've seen it with, with different situations, not only in this situation. You know, uh, there's so many areas that I can mention where we've picked up where the, the community will take the law into their own hands. One of the reasons, they do not trust the police. That's one thing that they tell us. The other thing is they, 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 they fed up because they say the police are sometimes involved in certain crimes, so they do not trust the police. Um, and you know, community members get fed up and frustrated and say, we're taking law into our own hands. We know it's that guy. But in many cases, and we know that there's a lot of them uh, where an innocent person was prosecuted by the community. Mm -hmm. Panel, what are your views now after looking at that, Glenda? Good point. <laughs> okay, good point. An innocent person can also get harmed in this process. And I don't believe in vigilantism. And I believe that the rule of law should be upheld. I think part of the problem and part of the reason why this kind of thing is happening, I have to understand why it's happening, is because you do, as you say, see rapists walk. You know, one, and that woman knows that that man raped her. But the police, there's no evidence. The police have lost the evidence. They go to court and some judges have a lot of compassion for rapists. And then we, you know, then there's more and more anger. And, and what I saw on that clip is also it's men attacking the man and the, the victim of that violence was um, a woman. Women were killed. Uh, so it's not just about women being anti-men or anything. There are a lot of men in society, and it's not all men that are violent against women. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of men in society who are also angered about this thing. So, you know, at the level of the police and at the level of evidence, at the level of... Um, the sides that, that judges should be on the side of the law plus on the side of uh, the right side. There are lots of different layers in society that we're seeing and I think you know, something needs to be done and something needs to be done urgently. If there's a life sentence for murder and if there's a life sentence for rape and if one can get the evidence to put these people away, then we have to do that. All right, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there on the topic. We're going to take a very quick ad break. And after that, I get to read your tweets and, of course, ask my panel what they anticipate will be the leading stories of the week. Don't go anywhere.
All right, okay, we're going to continue with the show now. All right, panel, let's see what you think will be in the top stories this week. Let's start with you, Glenda. I think the, the Tuli Madansela story and the Zuma and Kandla story is going to continue. I think the Nat Nakasa story is going to die down. I think the judge under fire is going to be another, another big story for a while, actually. All right, Ralph, what continuing, do you anticipate? Continuing outrage on the judge, but a slight gradual understanding of what that judgment means. It will start to set in. Uh, there will be, uh, you know, expression of outrage, but the understanding will start to set in on that. And of course, the report on Uganda uh, will continue in Parliament, and also the motion of no confidence against the Speaker of Parliament. It's oh. going to be a big issue. So. All right. Thank you so much, Ralph. Well, very quickly, Mele. I'd echo that. I think the shenanigans going on in Parliament will definitely be top of mind. And I think also be serious. All right. Thank you so much, panel. Unfortunately, we don't have those tweets ready today. Unfortunately, we can't uh, see what our viewers uh, have written to us uh, today on our topics today. But nonetheless, our viewers' contributions and suggestions is highly valued. You can follow us on Twitter at SA Media Monitor. Share your views and comments on Facebook. Go to www.facebook.com forward slash Media Monitor. And of course, like our page. You can also email us your views about the show. That's Media Monitor at sabc.co.za. Thank Thank you so much for watching Media Monitor. Join us again next week right here on the SABC News channel. Just in case you missed our live show, remember, you can still catch the repeat tomorrow morning at 2 a.m. From myself, Alicia Jali, and the rest of the QTIV team and the panel, have yourself a blessed Sunday. Goodbye. What is wrong with African players? Why are they not winning? Our officials, they don't look at the bigger picture of players being happy mm -hmm. before they go to the pitch. Because mind game is very important. Seek ye first the goals. I am playing the tactical strategy on the field of play. And all other things shall be added unto you. Don't put money before. The African coaches, did they do well? I think so far they are doing well. I do not agree. Sometimes local is lacquer is dangerous because I'm telling you, he who cut the road does not know that his back is zigzag. Ghana proved to be a damp squib. You cannot go to war with chickens. You go to war with your best commanders. What will it take for Africa to make it at international level? Bring what? professional coaches from anywhere, whether from Mars, Moon, Jupiter, to come and coach okay. and get us the results. That's Steve. what we want. You. you can't be a coach simply because you play football. And Adam, do you have to be a drunkard in order to own a bottle store? No. Watch Question Time with me, Mpo Tseidu, Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. Hello, Kunjani. Salamu alaikum. Khoyemore. Namaste, Jumbo Africa, and a very warm welcome to SABC News Channel 404. South African Revenue Service has upheld its impressive record of collecting taxes. SARS collected about 86 billion rand more in the fiscal year compared to the previous year. The message we want to communicate is that government must also live modestly, and uh, that when we're looking at these sorts of issues, uh, modesty is an important message to, to communicate uh, to, to the public. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. Can South Africans survive 2014? Many of us actually were given bazaars by state-owned enterprises, but the state shrunk, telecom was privatized, and now you are sitting with huge unemployed people, but huge backlogs in terms of infrastructure that could develop the same young people. It's in our hands, and our future is up to us. It's a tough year, and tough decisions will have to be made by the government. Uh, it's an election year, which makes it difficult to make tough decisions. I mean, it's tough to make tough decisions. <laughs> it's especially tough in an election year. That's Rights and Recourse, Sundays 2 p.m. on SABC News.
Murder accused Oscar Pistorius could face at least 30 days in psychiatric evaluation. Mr. Pistorius has a long history of generalized anxiety disorder that appears to have been increasing with time. The state can ask for such an evaluation according to Section 78A of the Criminal Procedures Act. It is likely to have commenced at the age of 11 months when he was hospitalized and underwent bilateral baloney amputation. So you agree with, with me if I say that he foresaw the possibility that he might have to shoot when he armed himself yes. and approach the danger? Yes. Make sure you don't miss your world weekdays between 11 and 12 midnight. Technology is all around us and is improving lives across Africa like how young Nigerians are connecting to the internet. There are doctors finding new ways to save lives in Cameroon and the South African public transport system that is now getting Wi-Fi. We have gadgets, apps and loads more, some of which play a big role in Africa's growth. A huge part of this African growth is technological innovation. To find out a bit more about social media and technology news from here in Africa and abroad, Join me, Pumele Lezondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. on SABC News.